let me first shock you. Sure. You know, and then after that, you know, we Adventists should be the most ecumenical people in the whole wild world. Okay. The a negative side of the ecumenical movement, it has the standard to downplay the importance of truth. Seventh-day Adventists as a church and as individuals should never be involved in ecumenism. Okay, his name is Ganun Diop. Why do I have this man on my channel today? Well, we're going to talk about this man for a number of reasons. First of all, let's ask the question, who is Ganun Diop? Gunun Diop is Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the Worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was elected in July 2015 at the 60th General Conference Session in San Antonio, Texas. Gunun Diop is an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister and has served as a local church pastor. And one of his mission is to travel the world, as he says, to share the Adventist message. He says the privilege, he says he has the privilege of presenting the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world and has helped him grow in the art and science, respecting others, of developing productive relationships with those of other religious and philosophical persuasions. Okay. So, Ganun Diop in this video is telling Seventh-day Adventists that it is a good idea to join the ecumenical movement. Now, before I watch this video, let's ask the question, what is the ecumenical movement? According to pluralism.com, the ecumenical movement is, let me see if I can make my words a little bit bigger for you. Okay. So the ecumenical movement has been around for years, but the point is this. Members of the Protestants, Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Mormon churches all call themselves Christians, yet they also maintain theological and practices that diverse in significant ways. Ecumenical organizations such as the World Council of Churches and National Association of Evangelicals attempt to bridge those differences, although such effort remain controversial. So this is an effort to bring churches together with their different views on theology. This is laying aside our differences in a, mess, in, a in a way I could say it, laying aside our differences and let's all become one for Christ's sake. The world, the word ecumenical movement comes from the Greek word uh, ok okumini, <laughs> meaning the world and habited earth. Okay, so. It, 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 the World Council of Churches does not seek to become a super church, according to them, but rather a fellowship of churches, a uh, reform for exploring and expressing the common faith of the church in witness and in service. So, so there's a lot to be said about the ecumenical movement, but I want to listen to Ganundi about this moment. I want to hear what he has to say. He is addressing the seven day Adventists here. And he is advocating for Adventists to join the ecumenical movement and not seen in the positive and negative things. And he is sharing the reasons why he feels that way. Okay, let's take a listen. The Seventh-day Adventist Church attend a meeting since 1957. 1957. I was not even, you know, there, right? So... The meeting is called Conference of General Secretaries of Christian World Communions. Okay? Why did the Adventists, and actually I had a slide I wanted to show, but uh, I cannot show my uh, uh, PowerPoint. So, they have several lists. A list that is called Christian World Communions, meaning churches that are considered genuinely Christians. On that list, we have Seventh-day Adventists, General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And on the section nine, because I remember clearly, I presented it several times, you have churches that they call with heterodox Christology, meaning they have a different understanding of who Christ is. And on that list is uh, the um, Latter-day Saints, Mormons, Church of, uh, Church of Scientology, Je Jehovah Witnesses, 
and few other things. Now, Adventists have been diligent since Bird Beach and after John Grass and myself now to make sure that we will be kept on that list with genuine Christians. That's part of our work. Now, uh, something fascinating, they asked me to be the secretary. So what is the role of the secretary? I organize one meeting a year where these leaders gather every denomination present on their own term who they are, what they do, and why. I've been doing that now for over 10 years. Because of these things, then they develop confidence. They're going to meet in Accra, Ghana soon. This world leader, we're talking about Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, uh, uh, Orthodox, and you name it. And they asked me to write the content of John 17 a Seventh-day Adventist. Why? Because when we mingle, then they get to know who we are. And they start developing confidence and trust, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et now, I don't explain this everywhere so that to let people look what I'm doing. That's nothing to do with that. Okay? But it can be helpful to be prudent. Okay, first of all, when we talk about ecumenism, let me first shock you, Sure. you know, and then after that, you know. we Adventists should be the most ecumenical people in the whole wild world. Okay. okay. Why do I say that? Do we not say we have an everlasting gospel to preach to the whole world? That's ecumenical, mm -hmm. as it's counted. Did he just say that preaching the gospel to the whole world is ecumenical, ecumenical, ecumenism? All right. I mean... I didn't think of it that way before. Between our, well, <laughs> before I say that, <laughs> every good thing has its counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Trinity, mm -hmm. counterfeit Trinity. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Christ, Antichrist, counterfeit Christ. The Holy Spirit, counterfeit. Church, counterfeit. And I could continue on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Ecumenism is exactly the same. If ecumenism means fusion of churches. Mm -hmm. We say, no way. If ecumenism means uh, the, the uh, <laughs> gathering of churches under a human leader, whether the pope, the patriarch, or whoever, mm. that's counterfeit. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. But real ecumenism is ecumenism under Christ. Amen. And that is the one that we promote. So according to him, ecumenism, ecumenism under Christ is what's being promoted here. Okay. Peer sometimes antiquated. People are, are afraid of words. And we appear sometimes antiquated in the world. Every, even ecumenical patriarchate. It's not a bad word for them. Ecumenical councils of the churches is not a bad word, even though we don't adhere to all the creeds that were developed throughout the centuries. So we should be careful also to not to appear people who are so backward and who don't understand anything, who live a total different bubble of what ecumenism is not bad in itself. What's bad is to compromise bad ecumenism, ecumenism under any other leadership but Christ. Amen. Mm. Okay. That's what we bring to the table. So this is why I wanted to add this. So because you know, every, <laughs> sometimes I go to places. Oh, you are in ecumenism. I say yes, I am. <laughs> I mean, on purpose because right, I right. know this is confusing, sure. but precisely for the purpose of saying, but what do you mean by ecumenism? And then we realize ecumenism for these people means apostasy. Of course, we reject that. Yeah. Apostasy, mm. seriously? Mm. We promote Christ and Christ alone. And that's one of the principles of the, uh, of the Reformation. Anyway, um, all right, you heard the man. So, 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 so. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot we can say about that. I, I mean, I hear his argument, okay? So ecumenism, there's a positive side of it, you know, and there's the truth and the counterfeit, okay? So as long as ecumenism is not under 
uh, by the le leadership of somebody else beside Christ is a good thing. Uh, it argues that the gospel that we preach, the everlasting gospel, is an ecumenical gospel. Um, it's calling the world, right? I'm not sure if he's calling the world to unity, but I think he's calling the world to repent. But if you if you ask me, I have a different interpretation of that. But that's what the man is telling us. So Ganun is 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 having this discussion with seven divinists and telling us that ecumenism is a good thing and we should join with the churches around the world. So let's ask the question. Let's listen to somebody else. And I want to hear this guy because he's going to make a, l a lot more sense. Listen to what he says. Well, the ecumenical movement uh, has uh, encouraged people to be open to dialogue, to speak to one another, to interact with one another. That's a positive thing because when we, we can talk to others, it is always a good thing. It is a positive thing. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when he approached the city of Athens in Acts uh, chapter 17, he entered the city by way of talking to people, listening to people, meeting with people, different places, different backgrounds, no matter um, you know the, the academic standing, he could talk with academics, he could talk to uh, business people and so on. The a negative side of the ecumenical movement, it has, it has tended to downplay the importance of truth uh, for the sake of unity, for the sake of... I want you to hear that again negative side of the ecumenical movement, it has, it has tended to downplay the importance of truth uh, for the sake of unity, for the sake of this common embracement of all, it has tended to marginalize the importance of biblical truth. But according to the Bible, there can be no unity outside of biblical truth. We are united in biblical Say it again can be no unity outside of biblical truth. Mm -hmm. We are united in biblical truth and therefore we need to uh, value the fact that uh, there are no other platforms for us to be united other than the biblical gospel. It's not a Seventh-day Adventist, by the way. <laughs> it's not a Seventh-day Adventist. So now we heard that. Let's listen to Elder Ted Wilson. We heard Ganundi up. We listened to what the Catholics are saying, the ecumenical movement advocates for. We listened to a man that is not even of our faith. Now let's take a listen to Elder Ted Wilson, the president of the General Conference. What does he say? What does he think? I want you to understand the great difference between making friends with government and other religious leaders and on the other side, ecumenism. Seventh-day Adventists as a church and as individuals should never be involved in ecumenism. Uh, um, let, let, let's hear that again. Seventh-day Adventists as a church and as individuals should never be involved in ecumenism, which means that you try to find some common ground in relationships with other churches and you give up some of your faith they give up some of their beliefs and you find some common way of moving ahead. Seventh-day Adventists base their convictions and beliefs on the Holy Word of God. You know what the disciples said, we ought to obey God rather than man. But the Bible also tells us to pray for our leaders. We are to be friendly with people. And that is the great work of the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department, of the work of administrators. We can make friends for the church with people, but it takes a lot of hard work to cultivate this special relationship with Prime Minister Andriotti. You have to take time and explain and, and find ways. Seventh-day Adventists ought to be in the very front of the line making friends with people, but don't ever compromise your beliefs. That was abundantly clear to me. We should make friends with people. We should unite as much as possible as long we don't have to compromise the truth. You know, it's easier said than done that ecumenism will never lead us to a place where we're gonna have another leader apart from Jesus. It's easier said than done. But the reality is, that's exactly what it does. Now, it may be safe to be among those who are part of the ecumenical movement. It may be safe now. 
but what is the trajectory? Where does it lead ultimately? So uh, let me share a few words here with you that I thought I'm going to add to my presentation and 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 uh, make some sense of this. So I'm going to read. I'm not here to argue or fight. All I'm doing is reading here because we have a call and a purpose, and we need to be very, very, very careful. Listen carefully. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Great Controversy 45, paragraph 3. After a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church. What did they do? Dissolve all union with the apostate church. Okay. If she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry, they saw the separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dare not tolerate errors, fatal to their own souls, and set an example which will imperil the faith of their children and children's children. Carefully listen to the next following words. To secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God. But they felt that even peace will be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. If unity could, could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, listen carefully now, let there be difference, even war. The context is the Protestant Reformation. And as they realized that the Church of Rome was not going to change her ways, they chose to remain divided in order for the truth to remain pure. Let's go. GC 587. Application. The leaders of the Sunday movement may advocate reform which the people need. Principles that are in harmony with the Bible. Yet, while there is with these a requirement which contrary to God's law, his servants cannot unite with them. Nothing can be justified, nothing can justify them in setting aside the commandments of God for the precepts of men. I'm just reading. By this first beast is presented the Roman Catholic Church. This is the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 278. An ecclesiastical body clothed with civil government, having authority to punish all dissenters, the image of the beast, the image to the beast represents another religious body clothed with similar power. The formation of the image is the work of that beast whose, peace, whose peaceful rise in mid-profession render it so striking symbol of the United States. Again, we've already spoken about this in this channel. There's videos online where you can look at, into the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, and so on that we have here. I'm going to put a link in the description. Here is to be found an image of the papacy. Carefully listen to this. Protestant churches that have allowed, that had followed in the steps of Rome by forming alliance with worldly powers have manifested a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. Persecution always follows religious favoritism on the part of secular government. So could... The ecumenical movement be among the movements that are setting the stage for this supposed union that will eventually lead to the enforcement of the mark of the beast and the formation of the image of the beast. I'll let you answer that question. Let's keep moving. When this is this is this is powerful stuff we're reading right now. When the leading churches of the United States uniting with such a uniting upon such points of, of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then Protestant will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the affliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. 
What did they do? They lay aside their doctrines and they're all uniting. And as they're uniting on the common truth, what did they go on to do? They went to influence the civil government. So as they influenced the civil government, what did that result? What was the result? It resulted in the formation of the image of the beast. And the image of the beast resulted in the formation of what? The mark of the beast. And then what will be the final result at the end of the day? Uh, the dissenters will be inflicted with persecution. That's what we are told. Let me read the Bible. And they're following another angel flying in the midst of heaven, right? We are told that the second angel's message is a call that Babylon is fallen one time. Babylon is fallen a second time. So why is Babylon falling twice? When you study furthermore, it's fallen twice because the first time Babylon rejected the message of repentance. It happened to the Protestant Reformation. The second time, Babylon hasn't changed. It's still rejecting the message of repentance and held on to false teachings. So Babylon is in a place where it cannot be converted. What does that mean? The Church of Rome and her apostate daughters will not change. But what will change? Some people will leave the Babylonian churches. They will come out of her, my people. And these people will join the remnant church. They will become, they will be part of God's church, the pillar of truth. This is what we are told in prophecy. But as far as looking for these churches to just unite with us and become one and agreeing with us on a point of doctrine, we are making a huge mistake. We are told that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So keep in mind Jezebel. What did I say? Jezebel. Okay, we're going to come back to that. The world is against us. The popular churches are against us. The law of the land will soon be against us. If there was ever a time when the people of God should press together, it is now. God has committed to us the special truth for this time to make known to the world. You know what we should be doing right now? Instead of uniting in ecumenical movement or even suggesting it as a positive thing, we should encourage the people of God and the division that is happening within the Adventist church, we should be fixing that. The division with mainstream Adventists, division with the offshoots, division. Like if we as a people will unite on the things that matters as far as the truth is concerned, the mission, the message, and the doctrine. Unite in the love of Jesus. Unite as we are led by the Spirit of God, loving one another, watching each other's feet. We do that first, and then there will be serious power to influence the world. Instead of going to them, friends, we should be going to each other and make peace among these divided bodies and different segment of the Adventist church. That is where the work begins. Now, who you're told, and I'm done. This is my last one. I'm done venting. I'm done talking. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest, our courage and fairness the most unflinching, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when... Uh, when, when champions of you, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. So what should we do? Well, we should behave like Elijah. Exactly. We should behave like Elijah. The best way to deal with all the division, it's okay. Let them call us name. Let them say this about us. As long as we're standing for the truth and we are living a God-fearing example before man, and guess what? They have to argue against the truth from that perspective. Should we make friends with others? Of course we should. Should we reach out with others? Yes. Should we go on their turf and minister to them and, be, and, and, and meet their needs? Absolutely. But should we join ecumenical movement for the purpose of supposedly reaching the world? I don't think so. Here is the thing. We are told that Elijah, let's go to Kings. Let's go to Kings. Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18, right? We are told that Elijah, <laughs> there it is. Was it, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? 
how I hid a hundred of those prophets of the Lord. Now Elijah is talking about them and fed them with bread and water. And by the way, Elijah and Jezebel spiritually is still on the scene today, guilty of shedding the bloods of God's people. And we are told now, thou sayest, go and tell my Lord, Elijah is here and you he will slay me. So we know the servant of Elijah was afraid of that. And then I want you to notice what happens when Elijah showed himself to Ahab and his wife, Jezebel. And he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel because he challenged them, right? The challenge was, I thou he that troubleth Israel. So Elijah was a trouble in the land for Ahab and Jezebel, this union of church and state, Elijah was a trouble to that. <laughs> okay. He did not. He was a problem in the land. Here is the thing. And he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but thy father's house and all that has forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. Have the modern day churches today, Christian churches, Catholic church and many of the Protestant churches, haven't they forsaken the commandments of the Lord also? Haven't they said the law of God is nailed to the cross? Haven't they said the Sabbath doesn't apply? Haven't they been saying obedience is legalism? Haven't they been saying stuff like this? Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel onto the Mount Camel. And he went on to say, and the four prophets of Baals. And I want you to hear the next things. We eat at Jezebel's table. So if Jezebel, from a perspective of spiritual interpretation, represents the Roman Catholic Church, and Jezebel is also mentioned in Revelation, by the way, just in case you are wondering. So she's not just a historical figure. She has a prophetic application to her as well, especially when, the church, when it comes to the church of Tyra, which is when the church began to unite with the state, which give rise to the Roman Catholic Church. Her name is mentioned here in Revelation 2, verse 20. So it's good to keep that in mind. So if that is the case, since this is the case, aren't the prophets of Baal eating at Jezebel's table until today? So when ecumenical movement is happening, aren't you being fed from Jezebel's table, given the teachings of Jezebel? I want you being fed that the church of Rome has changed her ways. I want you being, I want you, be, I want you singing her songs. I want you being told to read and consider everything she has to say as if her character has changed. Hmm? Isn't that what's going on here? Is it, for example, con il primo where it is? There it is right there. What's going on? Isn't that what Jezebel's table looks like? Isn't that what Jezebel's table looks like today? Yes. So I can say a lot more, but I want to end this video. Friends, Ganundi Ab needs prayer. He needs prayer. <laughs> I mean, with all due respect, bruh, you're going to set the people of God for serious trouble. We Adventists should be the most ecumenical people in the whole wild world. Okay. If you keep saying stuff like this, friends, we should make friends. We should reach the world. That's why we have a podcast. That's why we talk. That's why we have a YouTube channel. We got to visit the world, minister to their needs. That's fine. But do we need to join a ecumenical movement to do that? No. Is there any examples in the Bible where the churches, early church haven't done anything like that? No. Why are we doing it? Uh, Jezebel's table. Anyway, a lot more could be said. I want to end this video. Share your thought and perspective with me. I want to hear from you. Do you think we should join the ecumenical movement? Do you think we should be part of that? Should that even be encouraged? Or is that something we should stay away from? You answer that question. Next, I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.